Well, welcome everyone to the session. We had a very nice introduction from Dr. Jimmy David, our lead, and we have two presenters today, um, Dahlia Fish and um, Professor Deirdre Haskell, who are going to uh, walk us through the how to get published in mathematics. And Dahlia is an experienced editor. And as you'll know, Pro Professor Haskell, who's a, a published mathematician and author, and you will, um, if you want to know more information, you'll be able to find it on our website. So to go back to where we were, apologies for that, I meant to press record. And uh, Dali, if you'd maybe like to open up, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. So again, my name is Dahlia Fish, and I have been working with the Fields Institute on two series, Fields Institute Monographs and Fields Institute Communications uh, on the Springer side. I think since I started at Springer, um, which was actually, it'll be 10 years in June. Um, so it was initially under Elizabeth Lowe, who was in charge of it. And then it kind of got passed over to me. But um, yeah, that is about how long we've been working together on these series. I believe Fields Institute publications were through AMS before. Um, so like I said, we have these two series. So we have Fields Institute monographs, which is for monographs and Fields Institute communications are the contributed volumes and that may come out of uh, workshops and other events. So um, we really love to have both of those and I encourage anybody to submit them as they get further along. Um, and we do a few a year. Um, the monographs, you know, are, are more focused, um, high quality research. Um, I you know, read a little bit off the, um, kind of adapted from the field site, just so you know what you can find there. But we're always happy to publish Fields Institute activity related monographs in this series. I also run other series such as developments in mathematics and sources and studies in the history of mathematics um, and Springer briefs in mathematics. So I do other things at Springer as well, but this is for um, Fields Institute activity related monographs. Um, and they're high quality research monographs and lecture notes in mathematics and applications of mathematics and science, engineering, finance, industry, and medicine. Um, ideally, the minimum page count is about 150. Um, and what you would do if you had a monograph to submit would be to fill out one of our proposal forms and you would go through your address. So that's a little bit different from how most books get submitted. Mostly I am, for most books, I'm sort of the first line of defense. I'm who gets the proposals and has them reviewed and considers them with series editors. Um, but for fields, you would go through the Fields Institute first. And um, so that's a little bit different. And it's the same thing for communications, um, which generally has a higher minimum page count. We're looking for more like 280 pages. And that's, um, you know, papers coming together and those come out of workshops like Mathematics for Public Health. Um, the COVID volume should actually, you know, mathematical modeling for COVID-19 should be um, out by next week. Uh, <laughs> production has definitely been uh, complicated in the age of COVID. I know for books all over the world, all kinds of books, um, you know, when things like um, there was just a story of all the boxes of two cookbooks that were supposed to come out in February fell into the sea. And so <laughs> now they're publishing in July and September. There's been a lot of stuff like that. We actually do, I mean, most of our, now at this point, you know, people are, are, I think our sales are more primarily electronic. Books get sold as part of an ebook package. Um, so that's really how things work. So institutions would buy, say, the mathematics and statistics package and the Fields Institute books would be part of that. And um, so that's really how most things get sold. We do, of course, also publish hardcovers, but that's print on demand. So you don't have to worry about books tumbling into the sea. Um, and that's how we've been doing things for, I think at least as long as I've been at Springer. So again, we're talking like at least 10 years, um, only in rare occasions would we print books in advance. Um, and yeah, I would, I would start with that. Um, I think now feels like I'm gonna move over, over to Deirdre to talk about the initial submission points. And then maybe I'll talk more about the overall um, publication process and and reasons to publish, et cetera. So I'm gonna move it over to Deirdre now to talk about how it begins at the Fields Institute. Okay, well, thanks, Dahlia. Um, and I think I might be a little bit more general than just what talking about the Fields Institute. Uh, so just in case anybody doesn't know, I am the deputy director of the Fields Institute. 
And as part of that job, I'm acting as the managing editor of the Fields Institute publication series. I'm also a managing editor on a totally different journal, which is called uh, MathLogic Quarterly. Uh, probably none of you are interested in publishing in MathLogic Quarterly, but it serves as kind of a representative sample of a mathematics journal. Um, and uh, then uh, I'm also I just recently uh, become an editor of uh, La Matematica, which is a new journal which is being put out by the Association for Women in Mathematics. And so there's a kind of a variety of different kind of publishing options here. Um, La Matematica is looking for both research articles and more uh, kind of more expository articles. So it's it's a interesting uh, area, possible avenue for publishing that you might think about. Um, so the um, the Fields Institute series, the monographs and the uh, and the um, communications are kind of uh, represent uh, different ways in which you might want to publish. So a, a monograph is a you might think of it as being is, is an exposition of an extended piece of research. Um, Dahlia said 150 pages as being the minimum, and that's kind of if you have an extended piece of research, something that was really long, and that you might otherwise think of as being published in a journal. It's a research article with new results that you want to talk about, uh, but is really kind of too long for most journals. Some journals will take papers that long, but it's not, it's kind of above the standard. And so thinking about publishing it as a research monograph is one possible alternative. Um, the Fields Institute ones are often, um, might be uh, an extended series of lectures in which somebody exposed a, an, an extended piece of research. They might then write that up as, as a volume for this. Or I have another one, which is the, uh, uh, the, the graduate courses that took the place as part of a thematic program. And that's something which again is, is uh, some of it's expository, but it also leads up into new results. And so this is something which could be considered a monograph. And so that would be when you've done a, you know, a major piece of work, which you really want to have appear as a book. I have one uh, piece of work which appeared as, as a book, as a, as a mon research monograph. The communications are, um, are would be, it's like the, um, the proceedings of a conference. So if we have a workshop, which has uh, a lot of different uh, people giving talks. And then the organizers might say, you know, this is, this is important enough and there's topical enough results and, and, and significant enough results that we'd like to have them all appear collected together in one volume. And uh, a piece, a volume like that is, is kind of like submitting a paper to a journal, except that the journal is, it's one issue which is dedicated to a particular area. So, uh, all, all, the, um, all the, the papers that are there are connected in some way much more than, than in a usual journal. And so the uh, volume, which is the proceedings of the, of the um, Master of Public Health uh, series last year is, has that form of all, all talks which were in a very concentrated area of mathematics. And those would normally be, the, the editors would uh, have the uh, papers submitted and they would have them refereed just as if you're submitting a paper to a journal. Uh, but then there's some uh, expectation that it's pretty likely that your paper will be accepted, but there is also the, 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 the refereeing can, can do a lot of work on making sure the writing style is up to a, a acceptable standard and paying attention to, to, the, to the whole presentation. So that would be uh, in order to create such a communications volume, the um, the edit, uh, the uh, organizers of a workshop would submit it to the Fields Institute and say, we'd like to have this, this collection of, of papers. We're, we're expecting to have between 10 or 15 contributions. They would be approximately this long. They're all about this topic. Is, is that reasonable for a communications volume? And then I would discuss it with the editorial board and let them know whether we think that that's appropriate for a Fields Institute communications. So I, maybe I haven't said much about the, the process here, but I think I might hand it back to Dahlia at this point. Hey, thank you. Um, and you mentioned a few things that I definitely want to address. One is, um, yes, the La Matematica journal is also Springer and there's a corresponding AWM book series. I happen to be 
the editor for that as well. So if you are in any way involved with AWM, Association for Women in Mathematics, those are two avenues to consider for publishing. Um, and then also I had mentioned briefs, but I'll dig into that a little bit more. And um, briefs are publications that we do that are brief. Um, they max out at 125 pages. So if you have something that has, you know, sort of a long, you know, <laughs> the feel of a long journal article, maybe too long for a journal article, um, but that's really its own, you know, assessment of state of the art, something that's, you know, really emerging and up and coming. It's, um, you know, it's a really good insight into a small burgeoning area. So um, I encourage you if, if you have something that's going to um, be in that under 125 page range, that's not a journal article to, um, you know, consider Springer briefs in mathematics or, you know, we have for, we have for all areas. So um, that's just another option. Sorry, I keep saying consider publishing. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm so used to the like, pitching it to people who are sort of actively going to be doing it and understanding. I don't know where everyone here is, you know, in terms of a publication journey or anything like that. So um, <laughs> take my delivery with a grain of salt in that way. But that's, you know, that is another good option for publishing. And um, I will also mention more generally in publishing, you're gonna find that different publishers have um, different focuses in different ways. So we, for example, do publish books that are more trade general audience, um, but outside of a few specific series, we don't do that much of it. And then you'll find that other publishers do more of that. We don't do anything that's targeted to, you know, other than things that are general audience, everything we do is targeted to undergraduate and up. So sometimes I get proposals for books where they're, you know, really excited about it for high schoolers and Springer's not for that. So things you want to look for in publishers are, you know, do they do the kind of books you do? Are they aiming for the audience that you're aiming for is a really big thing to consider um, in publishing. So um, I do want to mention that as well. Um, and then just other things that are kind of going on in publishing as we see it, I guess I'll talk about. Um, a few things about Springer that are, you know, kind of specific. Um, I mean, so I mentioned electronic is sort of the way things are going. Um, and this is for a lot of reasons. In something like a contributed volume, you can buy an individual chapter, which is great. You don't have to have, you know, buy the whole book if you don't need the whole book. Um, and we also have something called My Copy. If you have Springer Link, which a lot of institutions do, which I'm assuming the Fields Institute does, um, it's something where you can order a copy of any book and it's just a soft cover black and white version that's $24.99. American, I don't know what it is, Canadian, but um, that's been a really big asset too. And then obviously a really big thing right now is open access. We are doing some open access books, but I mean, <laughs> I will be the first to say open access is expensive. I can't tell you why it's quite as expensive as it is. Other than that, obviously open access has a major effect on the sales of the book. So since you're not getting income from that, you're getting it from the you know, article processing charges, if it's a journal or um, I don't know what they call that for a book because the article wouldn't make sense, but you know, the same kind of thing. It is expensive to make publications open access. So knowing your funding options, if that's something that you want to pursue is huge, knowing where you can get grants, knowing who supports it. Um, there are countries where it's really heavily supported um, and countries where it's uh, not quite as much and not so easy to get a grant, but it's something that we do love and really want to encourage publishing. Um, there's fully open access, there's, there's hybrid models. Um, we do, in a, within a contributed volume, you can have you know, an individual chapter be open access, even though the rest of it isn't, if the authors of that chapter were able to secure funding and they couldn't get it for the whole book, didn't want it for the whole book. I mean, we've had people with funding opt not to do open access because they didn't want um, you know, certain elements of the book have to be there, like it has to say that it's open access at the end of every chapter and it has to be referred to in the back cover copy. And so if an author is concerned that that's going to affect sales of the hardcover, um, I had an author fully opt out of it because of that. So <laughs> even though he fully had funding for it, um, something like that is unfortunate. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's, those are, are some of the biggest things right now. Um, 
but it's tough. The pandemic has been really tough and I think slowed things down for a lot of people, whether it is, you know, having childcare responsibilities or other kinds of responsibilities that make, um, you know, being able to do side things on top of, you know, the work you have, the caregiving you do, et cetera. Um, I think that's slowed down for authors, though I do see, I think briefs are becoming more popular in that way then because people don't have to write full length monographs while, you know, they can still publish. Um, so I haven't really seen briefs suffer, but I've definitely seen monographs and other series suffer as a result. And then of course you have conferences not happening. Um, so often, you know, they have them lined up for a year in advance, let's say, and for example, for AWM, I reach out to all these meetings that are supposed to happen throughout the year. They're all listed on the site. And, you know, one by one, I hear, actually, we're not doing that. Actually, that's happening in December. Could you check back in a year from now? Um, you know, or you have a conference and it's smaller than you mean it to be and you can't hit the minimum for a book. So, you know, and then reviewing, forget it. I mean, <laughs> reviewers have so much less time now. Um, you know, it's a big ask to begin with. Um, it's not, it's not a paid position. We do often give like free Springer books in exchange for providing a review, but that's sort of it. So, you know, there's people who are returning the favor and consider that that's part of academia. And then I get people who say, no, <laughs> I'm not doing this. This is free labor I'm not doing, or just a lot of people more than anything else, just I don't have time for that right now. And um, I think people are just much more pressed for time during the pandemic than ever before. Um, so that's been a struggle too. Um, but I still get people who are very excited to do it and the people who have time and are really enthusiastic about giving back to the community or are just excited by the potential of reading a book before anybody else. I mean, I love when I hear that back from somebody um, that they were so excited to be the first to read it. They can't wait till it's on the market. Like the book they request in thanks for reviewing is like that one when it's published. I, I do love when that happens. So um, there are definitely some really good satisfying elements to it too. And then obviously the fact that there's so much virtual access now to events has been um, really great for access for people all over the world. So it's 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 had its ups and downs. Um, I do, there are proceedings volumes I do um, for a number theory conference where now they have more participants than ever before. So these volumes are now huger than they've ever been because now more people can attend. So mixed bag. Um, yeah, I would say that covers a lot of it. Are we, do we, do we wait till the very end for questions? I don't want to be missing, like, there's something else people had really hoped to hear oh, about. No. I don't want to be no, totally that was, missing that. That was excellent. This has given us kind of lots of tidbits. I mean, I'm, um, so please, uh, if, if people want to switch on their cameras and ask some questions, um, but yeah, it's very interesting hearing how the pandemic has, has had this effect on or impact on publishing. And I can appreciate how it, it, you've lost, you know, it gives, makes opportunities and also lost a whole lot of opportunities as well. So there was two things I was interested in. One is these black and white soft cover. Uh, mm -hmm. What did you call them? This is really cool. I've not heard of this before. My so, copy. My copy. So maybe yeah. other people are, are familiar with that, but I'd be really interested. It's actually, in it is the thing where Springer undersells itself the most and it drives some of us nuts because it's like a fantastic option. It's actually, if I buy Springer books for home because my husband is very interested in food science. Um, so occasionally I buy food science books from Springer for him and that's what I buy. It's just, you know, especially for books that don't have a lot of graphics, if any, anyway, like who cares if it's black and white. Um, and yeah, it's $25. So that's a really fantastic option for classrooms. You know, if you really don't need the graphics to be color, it's really great, but you have to have Springer link in, in order to be able to order it. So there's that, but, um, but yeah, you not enough people know about it. And I wish we could scream it from the rooftops. And it's one of those things we really like to talk about to people who come to our tables at conferences, but of course we haven't really been having conferences, so. So perhaps you can send us, it would be great if you could maybe send us a link to that. And, um, and also just check, it is available in Canada. It's not a U, just a US only thing. I don't believe it's a US only thing, um, but you would know, I think you would know if you have it, if you go to Springer Link and okay. see um, if you have a, the option to purchase um, okay. my copy title, you would, you would be on any books product page, you know, hardcover software hardcover ebook and then if you have access to buy the my copy my copy 
so and I think I would convey a question onto you. So, um, and this is one that kept coming to me when I was trying to coordinate the proceedings is people are, are aching to know when it's going to come out. And obviously there's a, there's a, you know, even just when you're describing like the kind of delays because it needs, you know, editors and things have to be actually reviewed before they go to be reviewed after they're done. Oh, and that was another thing about reviewing as well. So um, I, it would be really interesting to know if you could just describe the timeline as to, so I know it varies, but let's say for example, um, I submit a chapter for proceedings or, or a, a, a paper for proceedings. Like how long does it normally take between, you know, it being accepted by the editors and then it actually turning into publication? I think that'd be really helpful. And that might also help people think about where they're going to publish. So, you know, if, if I want my work to go out quickly, what would be the best route for me? And, or, you know, or if I just want it to be part of a good solid piece of work that will be referred to you know because I appreciate this there's different timelines there so if you could maybe just um answer that like where where should we send our work depending on what it is type thing especially for the thinking of this as an early career group so so you know if they want to make an impact with some of their early publications so that's going to get out there and be attributed to them and they can use that to further their careers where are the kind of areas that are be good places for them to get published Sure. Uh, yes, we can definitely talk about this. So lots of different answers here. Um, at the most basic, once a book comes to me, um, I have it reviewed. It goes back to the author for revisions, assuming that's what was recommended by the reviewers. I get the revised files back. And then once we confirm it's ready to go to production, um, I do a few things for it. You know, that's where back cover copy is crafted and the book gets an ISBN, you know, that special identifying number and then it goes to production. Um, and that process uh, from when I get the final files until it becomes a book um, is about four months. So um, we'll start with that. But something like proceedings, they're not coming to me paper by paper. They're coming to the editor of the volume paper by paper. So if you submit your paper in April, but a different contributor to that same volume submits in November, the Springer timeline has no bearing. I will not have seen any of it by then. So you're gonna see a call for papers that has a deadline and hopefully everybody <laughs> makes that deadline and you have a full volume by then. But the point before it comes to me can be anything depending on the editors. So you really need editors who are organized, have it together, enforce a deadline, um, get a, you know, get enough papers together by the deadline, et cetera. So <laughs> you got to believe in those people, but a book is going to be slower than a journal article. I mean, that's just a fact journals. Some journals definitely have slow turnarounds. I have worked in journals. Um, I was at, um, I was at a journal for three and a half years before coming to Springer, just one journal that did 48 issues a year. And it, you know, again, it was dependent on the reviewers. The reviewers are slow, reviewers are saying no, there aren't enough experts in the area, too many conflicts of interest. I mean, all these things can make the reviewing process, you know, even just finding reviewers take a really long time. So there's no guarantee, but in general, journals will have the fastest turnaround. Briefs do publish faster than other monographs. Um, that's, um, yeah, we, we have different production terms for them. I don't know exactly what the turnarounds on that is. But for example, our deadline is if you submit something, if we get something to production by the first week of July, that, that means 2020, that pretty much guarantees publication that year, barring anything blowing up. Um, and for a brief, that deadline is like first week of September. And that, that pretty much ensures publication that year. So those are our different deadlines with um, when you would need to get something to have it published that year. Journals don't have such things. You don't, you know, they publish however many issues a year they publish and they should theoretically move faster. So that's usually gonna be the fastest way for you to do it. And then it just depends if that's right for you for other reasons. Um, you know, if that's right for what you're doing and, and yeah. So that's all a thing. Um, the reviewing process also is different in that um, for monographs and for communications, by the time I get a contributed volume, be it Fields Institute Communications or any other proceedings, they've been reviewed. That's part of the editor of a contributed volume or proceedings job um, to send those papers to me already reviewed 
include the, you know, the review reports, that's, that's um, the reader reports, that's part of that process. So when a contributed volume comes to me, that's going to production very shortly after it arrives. A monograph has a whole process after it arrives because I have to have it reviewed. I have to find experts in the field. I have to have at least you know two or three people who are willing to read it and provide useful reports. They get you know however many weeks they get to do it, depending on how long it is. For a brief, I might ask for it to be done in four weeks if it's you know 100 pages or six weeks. Um, a long book can be three months, and then they can tell me I need another one, and you're sort of you know, if you don't give the extension, you're starting again with somebody. If you give the extension, you run the risk. Now you've gone four months and they still don't give it to you. <laughs> so it's, it's complicated and there's a gamble. And so you have to go out to more people, but then are you using up your own, your whole pool in a complicated field? I mean, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of um, chances and networking is important and, and having people who feel the responsibility to, to give back to the community and want to do this is important. Um, and reviewing makes all of this go round and reviewers making deadlines uh, is what gets books published on time. But I, I understand why it's, you know, a sort of a tough side thing to ask people to do on top of everything else they're already doing. But that's, you know, just one of the complications where you can't ever be sure. But I, you know, just to reiterate, journal, the fastest, books, monographs, probably the slowest. Um, contributed volumes somewhere in between, but have yourself a good organized deadline enforcing editor. Um, and that should <laughs> make a strong difference. I see a hand. Yep. Uh, Martin? I see two hands. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, just going to, um, because this field is a bit interdisciplinarian in, because we're kind of in the aspects of both infection biology, uh, population health, and mathematics. This mm -hmm. kind of relevant is kind of what do you do in circumstances where something is very interdisciplinary and as such is a bit difficult as to where within a strand of published books to place it? That is a great question. And actually, I work on a lot of interdisciplinary books. Um, so the first thing is that you sometimes with those have options, which group you want to be pitching it to. So if you have a book that's mathematics or biology, you would... I would say, for example, go to the Springer website, look up relevant terms to you and see which, which group has been publishing it. So if you see more books like yours in mathematics, it's kind of a safe bet um, to go to mathematics. And if you see that it's bigger in biology, I would probably go to biology. We assign books subject codes. Um, so if you are submitting to mathematics and we're placing, you know, and we're doing it, then we're placing the book in the mathematics group. So it would be you know, like I said, we sell these as subject groups. That's that's how they get sold. So the first um, one of the mathematics categories would have to be the first code. So you know, mathematical applications to life sciences, or um, and for an idea of what kinds of things you can find in those codes, I mean, they're based basically on the MSC codes. Um, so if you can find something like that in there, we can almost definitely do it in math. So mathematical modeling. Um, we do mathematical biology, we do mathematical finance, we do mathematics and history, I do mathematics, culture, and the arts. Um, so we, we really do a lot of interdisciplinary work, and a lot of that is me, um, and there's definitely a lot of mathematics and biology. Um, so you know, which package do you want to, you know, would you see your book fitting into better? What do you see the publisher having more success with, with, with your particular area and having more experience with, with your particular area is, is what I would look into. Um, but it's not unusual for us. What I, what I have always wanted us to do a little better than we do is have those teams work together. So I, you know, me talk to somebody who's in the biology group and say, hey, this would be appropriate for your biology conference. I know it's math group, but could you take it with you? Um, because, you know, we have a li limited number of books that we can bring to these relevant conferences. So it's good when you have relationships with people that will allow it to sort of get a bigger group of eyes on it. Um, that can be a little tricky. I did a book that was that was really mathematics and religion because it was about a religious mathematician and there was sort of nothing I could do with the religious side of it. Um, so you kind of make your choices <laughs> about what you're prioritizing in it. Um, but yeah, I've, you know, definitely something we do and, and 
do well with, thankfully. So. If I could chip in here, I think I'd, I'd also say, you should think about who you want to read what you've written and who do you want, who, who is your desired audience? And then look for an outlet which is targeting that audience. So if you feel like your book is mathematics, but directed towards public health professionals, then you want it to be in a public health kind of series in some way or other. Whereas mm -hmm. if you think it's, you're trying to teach the mathematicians about the public health concerns, then you want, to be in, you want it to be something which is targeting mathematicians. So that's the thought to keep in mind. Right, I mean, think about it even in terms of bringing the books to a conference. Do you want them brought to a biology conference or do you want them brought to a mathematics conference? I mean, it's a really simplistic, like this is the tiniest piece of it, um, you know, in terms of marketing, but it's, you know, we have marketing campaigns throughout the year. Do you want, is it gonna fit into biology ones? Is it gonna fit into mathematics ones? It's just, you know, think exactly who, who it's really the most geared toward toward in terms of your desired audience um, and and start there. Yeah. Great, Another thanks. Yeah. yeah, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. So <laughs> uh, from Martin's question, so if you want to fit into mathematics and public health, so is there something like interdisciplinary? So I guess that was ma what Martin was saying, like if you want to fit into mathematics and public health, because sometimes when public health officials see mathematics, they don't read the textbook at all. So, but then if you want to communicate with them, you fit the math into public health or both. So that, that's just uh, about Martin's question. And for my, I have a couple of questions actually, but I'm going to go for the first two to allow others ask questions. So my first question is, if you notice um, some errors or mistakes, in the test book, what do you do about it? Do you discard or do you publish an errata or how do you handle errors like after publishing? So this has changed a lot. I may be misspeaking slightly because the policy is actually constantly changing. Um, it depends whose error it is and when it was found. I mean, we never wanna leave anything out that's inaccurate, obviously. Um, if it's found before, I mean, if reviewers find it, the author fix it up, fixes it at the revision stage. You have you know, chances to fix your files. Um, part of the production process is that you, know, you give us a manuscript and then we lay it out to look like the inside of a book. So that's proofs are those pages that you look at before it goes to publication. Um, and those are checked for errors. So then those go back to the authors and then you have a chance there to review your proofs and make any corrections there. Um, and so maybe we've found mistakes, maybe you've found in the meantime that you wanna fix. So that's another chance to fix before the book gets published. If the book has already been published, um, then yes, we have errata. There's nothing you can do obviously about the copies that already exist in the world. Um, we can, depending on the mistake, destroy the stock we have, that's called pulping. Um, so sometimes production will ask me, you know, with this issue that you found, do you want to destroy every existing copy of the book? Because, you know, there are some creative or complementary copies for the authors, et cetera. So, you know, I'll ask how many are in the warehouse and we'll make a judgment based on, you know, if it's, it's like an editor's affiliation, for example, where they, it changed and they forgot to tell us and they didn't realize in the proofs, um, you know, we wouldn't necessarily destroy for that, but depending on the mathematical information. Um, and then, yeah. Um, because we can change it electronically really quickly. And then because they're print on demand, we don't have thousands of books that are gonna have that mistake. So we change it electronically, we change the files, you'll have them, you know, you'll have it fixed for an ebook and then future copies of the book will print right. So there's, especially with the way we do it, plenty of chance to fix it. But I mean, it's so, so much easier to find it. You know, if you can be really careful before, it's so much easier if you can find it before the book is already printed because then you have to put the book on hold to um, it stops being available for purchase. It's, it's complicated. Um, but yes, you do have the proof stage also before it gets published. You know, that's, that's important to know. It's not the last thing you hand in. It's not the last you see of your book before it's published. Thank you. And you had a second question, Jimmy. Uh, should I ask now or let one of you ask? Okay, okay. great. So, so the, the second question is, um, you, um, like Sarah mentioned that um, our pandemic affected the Springer company because you mentioned, I, I think 
I was, I'm, I'm just curious about how it's affecting in both ways. So you mentioned one way that you don't have enough people publishing. So I'm just wondering that since there are no many people coming, then you should be publishing, the publishing should be faster. So how has the pandemic affected Springer as a company? Does that make sense? Uh, it does. I, yeah. I will say we are doing, we are not publishing much less. Um, I think I would guess there's a shift in what we're publishing, the lengths of what we're publishing. I would, you know, probably shifting more toward monographs than contributed volumes, at least in the beginning, because meetings were getting canceled before people were really um, successfully pivoting to doing things virtually. Um, but we did not actually see a significant drop in numbers of books published. Um, but then with every, as with everything else, the staff here is people. So when COVID hits, you know, if it if it hits a production department, things are slowing down. Um, and that did happen. We do a lot of the production is is done in India, and when COVID was particularly bad there, I mean, production was a little bit at a standstill for a while. And you know, we have the editorial staff we have, and each of us is alone on our series. So I'm the only one on the Fields Institute books, for example. So you know, if I got COVID and wasn't working for a week, no one's touching Fields Institute books here for you know, for, I mean, they're with me alone for a very small phase. So Fields Institute's actually a bad example there, but um, the human component kind of can't be stripped out of it is, is what I mean. But we're actually not publishing much less. I, I don't know where the numbers are hugely being made up. I definitely signed fewer contracts last year than usual and way under the goal I was supposed to, but I handed over more books to production than I had even budgeted for. So um, finding new stuff has not been the easiest and especially without conferences, but we are definitely still publishing um, a solid amount. Okay. Like that, that actually has not seen a steep drop. Thank you. Yeah. I, oh, Jan Hong, do you have a question for Dahlia? No, I don't have a question for Dali. I want to thank you, Dali. Actually, I interacted with Dali before, and uh, Dali, I'm a Jian Hong Wu from York University, and uh, I contributed to Fields Institute monograph series many times. Um, I, I, I just want to share experience with uh, regarding to Jumi's questions about what do you find mistakes in the in the book. Uh, it's the author uh, uh, published in Springer, so I did have a paper book published in Springer in 1996. Uh, in the applied math series. And uh, later on, I, I share my experience with um, Professor Jack Hell. He is a godfather in my field, functional differential equation published in Springer in 1977. So I told him I feel so bad that there are so many errors in my book. And he said, John, don't worry. I have many mistakes in my book. And uh, the the field progress developed because of those mistakes. People are correcting those mistakes and published. Uh, so, so if you find a mistake in the book, you, first you can write to the author directly. Most also will be very uh, uh, happy. Norris Peckle, he had a very famous textbook with Springer. I had a senior student who is my fourth year student, a retired high school teacher. She wanted to do a reading course. I say, okay, so, so, so just she asked me how to do that as I do all the exercises problem. She went through the whole book and found about 20 listed errors and uh, mistakes uh, in about 20 pages of four through his back and or just published in his home uh, website. It's there. I mean, those are the errors uh, printed out by, by a student. So um, I think you should contact with authors as well, and they will be more than happy to, to have this corrected. And some of the mistakes might be really nice for you to, to write a thesis. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I suppose I want to pull us back to this early career group, because now you can definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but. But my sense is that if you have a good idea for a book, whether it's a series of chapters, you shouldn't be shy to come and approach someone like Dahlia because they're looking for good, interesting books. And I do think this group here, um, and I, if I were ever to sing their praises, um, I know that the, the um, 
more established mathematicians in the network rely hugely on this group um, because they're the ones who who often do a lot of the um, the modeling work. So when there's when there's a lot to be done in terms of working with the data and, and fixing errors and getting the models running and, and, and putting together these really important, especially during the pandemic, pieces of information that have been used, in fact, by public health to make decisions. A lot of that work has been done in the background by these um, students and postdoctoral fellows. And they really are, uh, they've done, they've been the kind of workhorses in some senses of, of a lot of this work. So I know in this group, there's a huge amount of experience. They've probably been working harder and faster than they would have normally done in a non kind of emergency pandemic situation. And I know Jan Hong, especially, he's got so many people he works with, but when questions are asked, I know that Jan Hong goes to his his uh, his students and his postdocs uh, to help him work through these problems and so much learning there. But I do feel that um, in this group, I am so confident that there is that there is a book, a proceedings, a collection of of essays or briefs, or I just know you have have it because your experience is probably. Um, even faster than it would normally have been just because of the pandemic. So um, I, I would like Dahlia to come in and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if you think you have a good idea or you have a good group who do, you know, that, and you're excited by your work, you shouldn't be shy to, to approach Dahlia and she will tell you if it's, you know, if, it, if it's, if it's worth it, right. She's not going to, they're not going to publish something that they think isn't any good. So Dahlia, what do you no, think? We're definitely not in the business of doing favors. Don't worry about that. Um, yeah. And it's also, you know, whatever bias I have doesn't really matter because, you know, it still goes out to independent reviewers. Um, we look for experts in, in the field that you're writing about. So even if you're newer, if your work is good, it's going to be appreciated by somebody who knows it well. Um, you do not <laughs> ever have to feel nervous about it. If you ever just want to see what a, you know, sample proposal form looks like, for example, feel free to ask for one. I'm just dahlia.fish at springer.com. Um, I can tell you that the gist of what it has, you know, that it asks for is your contact information, information about the book. So that's, you know, would roughly translate to the copy that would be on the back of your book. Think of it that way. Um, keywords for your book, comparative titles. So you want to be aware of who is publishing something similar. And when I say similar, I don't just mean in the same topic area. Um, you know, a textbook is not the same as a monograph is not the same as a contributed volume. So you want to know what there is and what there isn't. Um, unique selling points are part of our marketing for every single book. So for any, any book that gets through, you know, our publication process, they have to do three things about it, which can be anything from that it's self-contained, it's great for classroom use, it has examples, it's interdisciplinary, and so reaches a wider audience. Um, for each of those selling points, you're going to think in terms of both what sells it, um, you know, what's the benefit, what's the feature, and what's the benefit, sorry. Um, so you want to think of, you know, any book that you want to propose, you should, you should, which features are unique slash helpful slash beneficial for the reader. And you're gonna to wanna to be able to enumerate those. Um, your table of contents doesn't have to be set in stone immediately, but you have to have the gist if it's a proceedings. Um, we have done those on, you know, not having everybody's paper titles yet or anything like that, but just having a basic idea of who they anticipate being in the volume. We've, we've contracted volumes based on that. Um, that can tell us a lot, um, you know, familiarize yourself with MSC codes. We have those on the copyright page of books. Um, and yeah, and what I didn't finish saying before, sorry, I was saying that when you have an interdisciplinary book, the first code would be math, but we can then use codes from other departments and that will cross feed. So I could use a mathematics code and then a biology code. I could use, I, I sorry, I keep forgetting to mention another series I do is Mathematics in Mind, which actually works with the Fields Cognitive Science Network. And if you know Marcel Denese, he's the series editor there. So that's another thing I do through the Fields Institute. And the other thing that brings me there um, when the borders are not closed. Um, and so that's also heavily interdisciplinary and that will overlap a lot with anthropology, with philosophy. So I'll use you know different marketing terms and codes there um, and keep that in mind as we do you know, as we do marketing, but there's, you know, this is why I say really interdisciplinary books really do strongly fit in the math department a lot. We, we do do a lot of them. Um, what else would we ask for in that? 
And then something to keep in mind is what, what societies might read it. That's sort of a more old fashioned question for the proposals now. I don't even know if they're on the newest forms, but to keep in mind if there's a societal audience for, for your work is, is something else to think about, you know, who, who you assume you can, would be your interested parties and who can reach and, and also your target audience. Are you, is your target audience students? Is it, um, you know, is it at a research level? Is it a broad audience for something, you know, a general audience for a trade book? So um, lots of different ways to think about how your book would be positioned, um, which are thinking about those things are, you don't want that to 100% guide the way you're writing your book, but you do want to think about it as you're writing your book. Do you have another question? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, so I want to be first, I want to believe that you're publishing other languages other than English. And the second one is, so from what um, Sarah said, which is partially, that partially cleared my mind on publishing. And I was wondering um, when you mentioned about um, open or not open access. So I was wondering about the money, actually the cost. So when it open who pays for the cost or when it's not open who pays so that okay makes sense. so um just ping me if i forget any part of that what was the first thing you asked before the open access the languages or the, the languages. languages yes so we um in the u.s office we pretty much only do books in english in the u.s we also have a very large presence in germany um, and we did, that's where you know, the company is headquartered. Um, so we do German books as well. We don't really do books in other languages. I know there are exceptions to that and I don't know what allows for those exceptions. We were just talking about books that were published in December and there was one in French that I was really surprised to see. Apparently it had a forward in English but the rest was in French. I don't know what allows for that. We do have offices around the world. Um, but as far as I know, they're not publishing in other languages. What we do have now that is um, a really nice asset is we have um, good translation programs. So I actually, for example, I got um, a manuscript from Dutch authors. They have a best-selling book in the Netherlands. They wanna translate it into English. They speak English, but not fluently enough to translate it themselves. So what we're doing is we put it through this translation program. It translated it into English. It did a pretty good job, but struggled with idioms, which wouldn't normally be such a problem in a math book, except that this happens to be for a general audience. So that is the way it was written. So the authors are kind of combing through it now and fixing that up, but they keep expanding that program to accommodate other languages. So in the beginning, they were really just using it for German and um, to be able to publish the, our German books in English, but now they're bringing in a lot of other languages for it. So I think we, I think we are now able to maybe translate also some East Asian languages. Um, and, you know, obviously we just did Dutch. So there is a way to work with books in other languages, but I think the aim overall at Springer is to be publishing them in English, if not German, and to do the German books in English too. Um, and then open access. So when that is paid, that's generally by an institution or, you know, they got, there's an article processing charge or whatever the fee is. Um, and there are different funders. So it could be grants, could be national. Um, it really depends on where you are. Um, if it's not open access, then it's just a published book and any costs are borne by Springer. So you should not be paying anything to publish a book. There are people who do. That book I mentioned that was, you know, a biography of a religious mathematician. They paid for it to be edited and laid out before sending it to me. Both of those things are unnecessary, but it happens to have been the path they took. So you should not be paying anything to publish a book unless you are paying to make it open access. Otherwise, no money should really be coming from you to a publisher. I mean, you can choose if there's other things you wanna pay for and um, people pay for their own translation or their own research or whatever. Um, but to create the actual book, that's, that's a publisher's cost. And that's why the publisher gets so much money from the sales of the book. Oh, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it used to be once upon a time that you had to pay money to have color graphics in your book. Um, I think that was probably 
like 15 to 20 years ago. I remember when I worked at that science journal, I would get questions about that all the time. And they had only just started publishing color uh, at no cost to the author. So I was surprised at how often I got the question because it had never been my experience that it went otherwise. Um, but that that used to be a thing where you had to pay for color. And I don't think that's that's an issue anywhere. Oh, some journals still do apparently. <laughs> well, um, yeah, that's, you know, so that is, for example, it's not something we would charge for. We host a lot of, you know, now we host videos for books and there's a lot more supplemental materials available for books. I mean, there's a lot of different options for really interesting things that you can do with your books. It hasn't come up for me as much as I know it's come up for some of my colleagues who do more textbooks than I do. Um, but there are a lot of cool options. And as far as I know, none of them cost money except for going open access. Great, thank you. Well, I think there's, um, I think all of us, uh, will have had experience being approached by, you know, that you get approached by someone who's asking for contributions. And as soon as they're asking for money up front, you know, it's a red flag and you do need to look into, you know, even a very senior levels, uh, they get approaches from sort of magazines and things. And you find out once you've gone so far down the process that you're then expected to pay, you know, $12,000 or something to get this article published. So, um, it's great having this relationship with Fields and Springer because, um, you know, if you if you want to avoid some of the heartache, you can start with with someone like Deirdre, who will be able to give you an idea of what's you know what's in the pipeline and what they're working on, and there might be something that you can you should always go via your supervisors, and of course, I'm sure many of you are working on um chapters and and journal articles and things as we speak and have things submitted but of course you know if you have an idea of something that you want to do yourselves and you can see that it's not being written about elsewhere you should consider getting a group together and, and doing it yourselves and i think there's something special about being early career scholars as well you know that's interesting in itself it's a it's a way of selling your book you know we're a, a newer group with some new ideas of our approach to something i think it's a it's a great angle into selling a uh, volume so you know do consider if there's a few of you you've got something cool that you want to work on you know do it you'd be surprised um because i know if it's you know no, if it's a good idea it's a good idea it doesn't matter who it's coming from so um so yeah i definitely want to encourage you to be bold to to get things out there and of course if you uh, are a smaller group of you who are well known to each other that network is probably more manageable than sometimes when you join these huge um these huge projects, which I'm sure Dalia and Deirdre are familiar with, you know, there's so many different institutions and so many different leads in the various teams, and that can really slow things down. But if you're a smaller group, then that might be a bit more manageable between you. You can get things out much more quickly. So that's a, nice, a bit more nimble um, in this, particularly in this group, if you want to do something. So if anyone's got any more questions, we've just got three more minutes now uh, left in the session. If anyone's got anything else you want to ask. Uh, Agnes, um, is it all publications that is free, uh, be it a book or yeah. monologue? Yeah, there was, there's nothing, I mean, speaking from Springer, you wouldn't pay to publish a contributed volume or a brief or a monograph. What you are paid varies depending on what you're doing. Um, so proceedings, for example, are generally not paid for. Those are what's called consideration. Um, and that's really just, you know, a group has had a meeting, they want it in print, um, but it's, it's it, not that it's, you know, a vanity project, but it's, it's really more for, for those people in that community and it's not something that really sells widely. For a monograph, you would expect to be paid um, a flat fee or royalties or both. Um, for a brief, it's a, it's a flat fee, so, uh, depending on what you do, you can expect some amount of money for your work, but there's nothing where if it's not open access, you should be paying for. I feel like I can't speak on like behalf of the entire world of academic publishing. I don't know if there's something where it's acceptable to be paying, but I don't think so. Deirdre, am I missing anything? I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. I, this, I was, okay, let me back up again. I have some in math, you don't generally pay to, to publish. Uh, there are other disciplines where you would <clears throat> you do have to pay page costs. Um, and I can't really speak to that. Okay, yeah, so I, I, it's a phrase I've heard, but it's not one that I've that I've experienced. It's 
the only things I've seen charged to the author from us are, are the processing charges for open access. Okay, so um, definitely I'll circle back with you, Dolly, to get uh, more information about the My Copy, because I think mm -hmm. that sounds really great. And, uh, and I know I enjoy, um, I do enjoy having print to work off. I find it can be much yeah. easier and working I think a lot of us one of the things I miss um being at home is uh, previously I had two screens or three screens to work off um when I was in an office and that made it much easier when I was like working on something and uh, now I have my laptop and I, I do miss like I said, don't print as much and I miss having access to books electronic resources aren't always as nice so um being able to get hold of um print copies can be can be fantastic when it's a a, a good uh informative piece of work so um, well thank you everyone I'm going to just hand back now to Jimmy who can close proceedings okay thank you so much um, um, Dalia and uh, Professor Oscar and Dr Nayani thank you so much for the great session I uh, that cleared all my doubt about publishing <laughs> because usually I would think in my head that only professors should publish <laughs> so thank you for that great contribution and thank you for the audience for the questions um thank you to professor Wu. thank you for attending the session and your contribution and really appreciate your presence thank you and hopefully um we'll get in touch with Dalia and Deirdre <laughs> thank you okay thank you Jimmy all right yeah bye everyone Thanks for Thank you. And I just put my email address in the chat if anyone has any questions they didn't get to ask. Great. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks. I'll pop that in the Slack channel as well. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye.